Hello, everybody. I know it's still really early in the semester, but it's time to talk about your term papers that you will be working on throughout the semester. In this slideshow, there should be all the steps that you need to follow, but there's also a PDF on Moodle that contains a lot of the information in here, as well as some additional information like a complete grading rubric. The goal of this writing assignment, like probably all writing assignments, is to help you put to use all of the things that you've been learning. And for the rest of the semester, you will be working on this paper in some form or other, making everything that we've talked about concrete through the data that you gather and the paper that you're going to write. So here's the basic process. First of all, you gather data. Second, you write a rough draft. Third, you submit that rough draft to one of your classmates for peer review, and you also peer review their paper. And then when you have that feedback, you revise and turn in the whole complete, beautiful work of scholarship at the end of the semester. Let's talk about the first part, the rough draft. For this, you will be making your very own family tree, except not your family tree, a family tree for a friend or an acquaintance who hasn't taken this class yet or ever. And then you will analyze it. So this is the heart of what it is that I'm asking you to do. For the rough draft, in terms of your analysis, I won't expect you to cite anything that we read beyond the week of March 7th because your paper is due on the 11th. So I don't expect you to, to read into the future. However, by the time we hit March 7th, you should be familiar with a number of foundational concepts, including descent, alliance, sex gender systems, care, different definitions of love and intimacy, popular ideas about marriage and what it is or what it should be, what it means, particularly companionate marriage, the idea of kinship as a process rather than a status, as something that happens over time, and the idea of chosen family, which is something that we will be covering that last week. In addition to knowing what all of these things mean, you should be able to use these concepts as appropriate to analyze your interviewee's family. By as appropriate, I mean you don't have to cite everything in the class. You have to identify which readings are going to be relevant to your interviewee's particular situation, to the particular data that you gather, and then use those readings and use those concepts appropriately. You have four weeks to do all of this. The paper is due, as I said, on March 11th, and that should be plenty of time for a rough draft. All right, now let's talk really briefly about how to interview and chart. Your family trees, when you draw them, should include symbols to represent each family member and their relationships to each other. I don't care what set of symbols you use, just as long as it's consistent and readable. To that end, you also need a key to those symbols on the chart so that we can all read it. Your chart should also include some basic biographical information about each family member. I don't want to give you a set list of categories in advance because for one person, it might be distance that is really important to the structure of their family. And for another person, maybe if there is a lot of interethnic marriage, for example, ethnicity is going to be really important to how they think about the structure of their family. But some things that you might want to include are the person's name. It can be fake, actually. Uh, their age, their marital status whether or not they're alive or dead, perhaps. Uh, again, their ethnicity or religion or social class or location, if relevant. 
It should also include the terms that people use to describe and reference their relatives. So for example, I have a sister. When I talk to her, I call her by her name. And when I talk about her, I call her my sister. So it should have that information on the chart. Make this chart as big as you can. Include as many collateral relatives as possible, your aunts, uncles, cousins, etc. Include as many generations above and below ego as possible. Um, only as much as ego knows. You don't have to send your friend to ask their parents about generations of grandparents past that they can't remember. Um, the fact that ego knows a certain amount about their family is in and of itself interesting information, okay? Um, include affines, though, if you can, to the extent that your interviewee knows about them. Include relatives by marriage and maybe ask how members of your interviewee's family have chosen to marry other people, whether um, those marriages lasted, whether the, the new person was accepted into the family, um, whether people who divorced have subsequently remarried, all these kinds of things. And then finally, ask whether your interviewee has anyone that they think of as family that doesn't fit on the chart. Just as an example, you can hit pause and spend some time contemplating this. This is a little simple hand-drawn chart that I made of some of my own close family members. All right, so... Once you have your chart data, you need to write your rough draft. The main question that you need to address in the rough draft is, how might you describe the kinship system used by your friend? What are the principles and values that underpin it? Here are some things to consider. Kin terms. What kind of system might your interviewee be using? Why? Stories. As you ask your interviewee about their family, um, to tell them about their parents, grandparents, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles and cousins, you will probably get stories along with just factual information about that person. So consider which of these stories were positive, which stories were negative, who exemplifies being a good family member. You might also discover through these stories, what are their feelings about marriage? How has marriage shaped their family? What does your interviewee hope for in their own marriage? What responsibilities do they understand kin as having to each other and maybe even different degrees of kin. And also, what distinguishes kin from other close relationships? What makes somebody family as opposed to a really good friend? Your thesis statement should be in your introduction and it should state in a few sentences how your interviewee understands family overall. And let's talk for a second about thesis statements. Here is an example thesis statement from a conference paper of mine that is probably about the length of the paper you will be writing. Look at this thesis statement. It sets up not only the topic, but it states the main results. This is the level of detail that I expect in your thesis statement. Don't just tell me that you interviewed your friend and you're going to present their ideas about family. Rather, tell me what your conclusions are about their ideas about family. The word thesis is related to the word hypothesis, right? If you don't have a concrete idea of what you think might be happening, you can't test it. A thesis is not just a topic, but rather it is a concrete statement about your analysis and its results. Okay, so you can pause this slide. Again, you can contemplate this. Let's move on. 
There are some additional things that I do want you to keep in mind as you're writing this that are maybe specific to writing an anthropological or a qualitative sociological paper. The first thing is to avoid banalities and overgeneralizations. For example, in Kazakhstan, everyone knows there's jatiyata, etc. I don't want to see that in any paper because probably most of you don't actually know your jatiyata, and this is a normative idea that you should know it rather than an actual fact about how people understand their ancestry and their connections to other people. So avoid this sort of thing. Avoid normative statements rather than statements that are about the specific history of your specific interviewee who is telling you specific things about their real life. Focus on the data you collect, not the data that you think you're supposed to find. Discuss your methods. Before you get into talking about your findings, tell me who you interviewed, why you chose this person, how you chose this person, maybe what your connection is to this person, and what kinds of questions you asked them in order to elicit the data for this chart and this paper. As I said earlier, your interviewee is probably going to tell you stories in addition to telling you facts about their family. Bring those stories that your interviewee tells you into your paper. Illustrate the points that you want to convey with concrete examples from these stories. Don't make a claim. Don't try to state a fact without backing it up with either a reference to the literature on kinship or to something that your interviewee told you. This is your evidence the evidence that you use to draw your conclusions. So present that evidence in the paper. Try also to understand your informant's actions and stories from their perspective. As I've said already, everybody is going to have a different idea about what family is, even in this class, even people from the same culture, because we've all had different sets of experiences and different families and there are some commonalities probably but no one is going to have quite the same view so be sympathetic to your interviewee finally put your ethnographic data into a larger social and theoretical context using the articles we have read and the concepts we have discussed in class you might also want to go outside the literature from class and look up scholarship on kinship in Kazakhstan to incorporate into your paper. Although, I'm going to warn you in advance, unfortunately, there's not much there. All right, so you've written your rough draft. Let's talk about submitting it, peer reviews, and how you're going to revise your own paper. So your rough drafts are due on Friday, March 11th at 7 p.m. So you have four weeks from receiving the assignment to complete it. Your rough draft should not be an outline or a half-finished paper. A rough draft should be your best attempt to do the assignment as directed in full. Just your first attempt. It's rough because it is your first attempt and you haven't had time to work on it and make it smooth, basically. So you will submit your rough draft, which must be complete to Moodle, and then you will also send it to your peer revision partner, and I will assign these. You will review your partner's paper, and then you have two weeks to read it, comment on it, and submit that peer review to Moodle and to your partner. Then you're going to get that paper back. You have four weeks to do your own revision. So you have as much time to revise as you had to write the paper in the first place. And I expect you to revise. If you do not revise your paper, you will not have completed the assignment, and so you will receive a zero. No paper is so perfect 
that it cannot be revised. Your revised final drafts will be due on Monday, April 25th, and your grades and my comments on your paper will be released after the final course grades have been submitted to the registrar. This will probably be around May 12th at the absolute latest. Your paper should be 1,300 to 1,800 words long in addition to your chart. You can draw your chart by hand and scan it. You can do it digitally with chart making software or a genealogy website. The format is up to you. Your paper should be double spaced. It should use a 12 point font. It should have 2.54 centimeter margins. The font should be something standard and classic like Times New Roman. Please don't use Arial. Please don't use Calibri. This is very specific, I'm sorry, but like, please don't hurt my eyes like that. New paragraphs should be properly indented. Your references and in-text citations should be properly formatted. Please use Chicago style author date citation. And here is a link to a citation guide. Follow it. So please, once again, for the sake of my eyes, and ease of reading, follow these guidelines. For a full grading rubric, check out the PDF instructions on Moodle. All right, let's talk about policies, last of all. As per the syllabus, late papers will not be accepted. Papers submitted over email will also not be accepted. And please, please, I beg you, Plan for Moodle's weirdness. You know Moodle is weird. Do not wait until the absolute last minute to upload your paper. Exceptions to the above may be granted in the form of an extension. Extensions must generally be requested in advance. And by in advance, it needs to be, you know, not two hours beforehand, like in advance. If something comes up, if you are feeling poorly, if you can't get your work done, the sooner you tell me, the better. In case of emergencies, of course, obviously, you know, if something really comes out of nowhere, please get in touch as soon as you remember that your university classes exist and you can think about them. Finally, a quick note about plagiarism. Plagiarism copying, or any other form of cheating will not be tolerated, and it will generally result in a grade of zero, as per the syllabus, along with a report to the Disciplinary Committee for Fact-Finding to, to find out what happened. Plagiarism consists of any attempt to present the words of someone else as your own, and it can be as simple as forgetting quotation marks around an exact quote. Without the quotation marks, the exact quote is not made separate from your own writing, so it looks like you're claiming it for your own. Using a quote and changing just a few words is also still plagiarism because you basically didn't write it. If you are citing someone else's words, make sure your quote is properly formatted with quotation marks and the citation, including the page number. And if you're going to summarize someone else's work or conclusions, do it entirely in your own words and include a citation to the whole work to be safe. Okay, I hope that this has made everything clear. If you have any questions, please let me know.